Okay, welcome everybody to the CRISP speaker series on privacy. It's our great pleasure to have uh, Ross Anderson. Ross is a professor of security engineering at the University of Cambridge. And he is a world-renowned expert in uh, security, security economics, and really where the rubber meets the road. And he works a lot with industry, with banks, with uh, government critters in order to uh, get security right. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to his talk. So let's welcome Ross. Thanks, Ian. Well, the title of my talk is Making Security Sustainable, um, the meaning of which should become clear in due course. So um, what I'm interested in, um, have been interested in for the past year or so is this. We've got two models of secure things that we can build. There are things like phones and laptops, which are secure because we patch them every month to fix all the security and safety flaws that have been discovered. And the um, problem with that um, is that within a couple of years, it goes out of support. This is a Nexus 5X, which I bought last year. Google tells me that they will stop patch support in September 2018 uh, because Larry and Sergey, I don't think, feel wealthy enough to support more than three or four old versions of Android. And then you've got things like cars and medical devices, where the idea is you test them to death, make them for five years, use them for 30 years after that, and never connect them to the internet and hope that you never, ever, ever have to patch them. So what happens to our support costs now that we're starting to patch cars? So, six years ago, I worked for a while for Google on sabbatical, and one of the things that we were worried about then was that companies who were phone OEMs like Sony and um, HTC and Samsung basically never patched old versions of Android. They had a team of engineers working on the Android they're selling now, and another team working on the version they were going to sell next year. And um, apart from that, that's your tough luck. So Google launched its own brand of Nexus phones, uh, believing that it could lead the market. It tried all sorts of other things as well. Even its own brand, as you see, is now basically a 30-month product. Um, other brands from other people are basically unpatched as soon as a new version comes out. And if you're a consumer, you've perhaps got a right to be unhappy about this. As a security engineer, you've got even more of a right to be unhappy. Uh, my colleague Alistair Beresford um, uh, runs a thing called Device Analyzer, where he has got about 30,000 people to volunteer to put uh, monitoring uh, software on their Android phones. And so he can go into his database and he can look at what proportion of Android phones are secure at any one time. And as you can see, the news isn't good. The majority of Android phones out there at any one time are insecure. And this is real... Um, implications for engineering. Facebook, for example, now do their crypto inline in their app code. Why? Because most of their users who come to harm as a result of privacy failures are in the second billion users. They're in less developed countries. And to a first approximation, all Android phones in less developed countries run malware. Why? Because they're all um, second hand or third hand or more so. So what about vehicles? Well, are we going to be able to take a similarly disposable approach to vehicles? Well, here's another piece of background that vehicle lifetimes in Europe have about doubled in 40 years. Sorry, I didn't have time to go and dig up the numbers from, for Canada, but I presume they're not too different. So the typical um, age in scrappage at the, in the UK is now 14.8 years, and um, vehicles are now doing closer to 300,000 kilometers than the 150,000 kilometers that they did 40 years ago. Now, some vehicle makers have taken the view that, well, we'll solve the patching problem by telling everybody to scrap the car after seven years and buy a new one. And I've heard one very large and famous uh, vehicle manufacturer, senior executive, say this um, in a circumstance where I'm not permitted to identify him, but you can see the um, attraction of it. But if you're a policymaker, ask yourself this, that the um, embedded carbon cost of a new S-Class Mercedes is about 35 tonnes, which is greater than its lifetime fuel burn. And are you going to be happy 
if the lifetime of that car drops from 300,000 kilometers to 100,000 kilometers. And then what about Africa, where most vehicles are imported secondhand? If you go to Nairobi, you'll see lots and lots of familiar old cars from the past, 20 years old, 30 years old. Why? Because they're 10 or 15 years old when they arrive in the docks at Mombasa. And then they get driven around for another 10 or 15 years in Kenya. And then they maybe get sold on or stolen or whatever and taken to Uganda and then Chad and places further afield. And so these cars are repaired so long as it's physically possible to do so. How do you go about doing software patching of a 35-year-old Land Rover that's already changed hands 10 times? OK, um, a number of you are familiar with the stuff I've done on economics of security, but just as a, a brief recap, uh, we've been looking at the economics of security and dependability for a bit over 15 years now. And what we found is that systems typically fail because people who guard them or who could fix them don't have the right incentives. So if Alice guards a system and Bob pays the cost of failure, you can expect trouble. And we find that banks dump risk, fraud risk on customers in countries where they can get away with it, like Britain, and their fraud increases compared with America that has got a tougher consumer regulation, with Canada being somewhat in the middle. It also happens with dependability, in that if you're running a national grid, you've got to make some kind of provision somehow to pay for the extra spinning reserve. Otherwise, the lights are going to go out whenever there's a surge. And in the electricity industry, people are mature enough to have figured out mechanisms to do this. They basically tax the electricity markets to provide a reserve to pay for the reserve. Now, another way of looking at this is that insecurity and fragility are often an externality. That is, a side effect, an emergent property of the transactions that people actually care about. And in this way, insecurity and fragility are a little bit like environmental pollution. Similarly, you may require collective action to do something about them. Now, when you start looking at information goods and industries, information goods and service industries, there's all sorts of things that go wrong, perverse incentives, asymmetric information. And one of the things that we've been doing is measuring what is actually going wrong, patching cycle, malware, fraud, and coming up with recommendations for how to fix it, what sort of policy remedies uh, might work in terms of what actors can actually physically do what and who could be motivated to do something. And we've now got um, over 100 active researchers at Weiss in San Diego three weeks ago. There were, I think, about 140 people present. And so we're getting to the point that people come and talk to us about what to do about a problem. Now, another thing that you may be familiar with, um, but if not, here's a brief recap, that IT platforms tend to be different from things like the market for cars or for coal or potatoes. Um, because of, of three features. Firstly, there's network effects, that the value of a network increases more rapidly than number of users, which means that things like faxes or email or Facebook or whatever suddenly take off once you get to a critical point. You also got low marginal costs um, in that it costs Microsoft billions of dollars to produce the next version of Windows, but thereafter only a cent or two for the electricity for its data cent or two make that copy available for you to download and upgrade. And that means that if there's price competition, markets can be drive the price to near zero. And then you've got technical lock-in. People use all sorts of tricks to see to it that the software that you've written for their platform won't run on their competitor's platform. And all of these individually tend to lead to monopoly and where all three are present, as they often are in our field, then you tend to get dominant firm markets where winner takes all. And this explains many of the things that go wrong perversely with computer security. Um, 20 odd years ago, I was doing some consulting for a small firm, uh, small at the time, called Microsoft, and helping to design things like the crypto API. And the view on campus in Redmond at the time was, ship it Tuesday, get it right by version three. That was the philosophy. And everybody knew this. <coughs> Uh, bigger firms like IBM were very down on Microsoft, saying these guys aren't proper software engineers, they're just hackers. But that was, of course, the strategy that worked. And if Steve Jobs had been a little bit less of a perfectionist, then perhaps Apple would have become a really valuable company in the 1990s, rather than having to wait until recently. So the, the, the platform economics and the way they interact with security and dependability are really, really important for understanding what goes on. <coughs> 
Because when you're building a network monopoly, you've got to appeal to the vendors of complementary products. So back in the 1980s, when Microsoft and Apple were slugging it out in the first of um, their battles, um, people would initially develop software for the IBM PC and also for the Mac. But by the end of 1985, we'd all figured out that the IBM PC, as it was then called, was drawing ahead, so you developed your software for that first. And so the IBM PC had more software, so people bought it, <coughs> so more people developed software for it, and so that became the dominant product, whereas Apple became a niche player. The same sort of thing happened with uh, Symbian versus Palm and Facebook versus MySpace and one thing after another. So what you find is that you get little security in the early versions, so it's easier to develop apps. And then once you've won the market, you lock it down, but in such a way that maximizes the benefit to the platform owner rather than necessarily to the uh, individual user of a platform. And we see exactly the same in payment networks and elsewhere. Payment networks are optimized for merchants and banks, not for cardholders. And you get all sorts of perverse effects, increased fraud and so on happening as a result. Okay, so with that background, we got asked a couple of years ago by the European Commission to look into how the Internet of Things would change safety regulation. Because the European Commission regulates... Um, you know, directly for two dozen odd member states and indirectly for many more, product safety in over a dozen different vertical sectors. And how is this going to change when you get software and everything? And so they asked us to pick three verticals and have a close look at them uh, and look for lessons that might be generalizable across other sectors too. So we looked at uh, road vehicles, medical devices, and at electrotechnical equipment such as smart meters. And the report that we produced is available now online in a cut-down version, which we produced as a paper for the workshop on the economics of information security last month. And we discovered a number of interesting things. So the EU problem statement is as follows. Um, when you start getting software everywhere and you create new safety risks around security, um, how do you update safety regulation and safety regulators to cope with this? Does the office that regulates the safety of toys suddenly have to hire one or more security engineers? Or do you get a security engineering resource centrally in Brussels to advise all the sectoral regulators? What sort of security development life cycle is appropriate for toys? And is it the same as for cars or for meters or for um, heart monitors or whatever? And there's also a cultural aspect because, curiously, English is one of the few languages where safety and security are different words. Sûreté, Sicherheit, Sicurezza, Seguridad, Trighead, almost all the languages spoken by people in Europe have safety and security as the same word. It's just that in English, the two concepts have diverged. And now it seems they're going to come back together again. So let's uh, look at one or two of the verticals. In cars, for example, um, we find that for the first 70 odd years of the car industry's existence, the industry didn't care at all about safety. Henry Ford's view was that if you were run over by a car, we're very sorry, but you must sue the driver who, um, who injured you. And if he says it was a fault with the car, then he should sue the person that he bought the car from. And if they said that, the fault was in the car when they bought it, then they should sue the person they bought it from, and so on. And the lawsuits didn't very often get back to Dearborn. And instead, the car industry concentrated on putting chromium on cars rather than putting seat belts. And um, safety was absolutely dreadful. Eventually, a guy called Ralph Nader came along and wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, which got Americans really um, annoyed and wound up. And this led to NHTSA, the National Highways Transportation and Safety Administration. And after a, a court case involving a car called the Ford Pinto that some people may have heard of, it had the, was in the habit of catching fire in rear-end impacts, burning the inhabitants to death. And um, eventually a, a jury in California uh, decided to award serious punitive damages against Ford after one of these incidents, after which NHTSA started mandating recalls when... Um, cars were found to be dangerous. In, in Europe, you had a, a similar but different story. We've got a product liability directive which says that if a product kills and injures somebody, 
um, then they can sue you regardless of how many times you've made them click on the Don't Sue Me button. There's a framework directive on type approval and many detailed rules. Now, we end up with over 20 European Union agencies, plus something called the UNECE, which is Europe plus Australia, um, New Zealand, South Africa, Japan, etc., the other non-US car-making countries, which puts together the technical standards that are then enforced uh, by EU agencies who subcontract the enforcement out to independent safety inspectors. So there's quite a big and complex ecosystem has grown up. Now, very recently, people started to realize that cars get hacked. And this is uh, a video made by Yoshi Kono, which appeared at Auckland 2011, um, of taking over a car remotely. This is Yoshi. So I, I had a beer with the guy who's driving this uh, test vehicle there, and you know he's one of these outdoorsy guys who goes cave diving and parachute jumping and so on. And yet he said that uh, driving in a car, knowing that his thesis advisor in a chase vehicle had remote control over his brakes, was the scariest thing that he'd done in his <laughs> life. <laughs> so not much attention was paid to that apart from by a few industry insiders. In 2015, Charlie Miller and Chris Varashek hacked a cheap Cherokee, um, basically by taking over um, Chrysler's Uconnect network, which is a, a private network run on Sprint. Uh, and they ran this Jeep off the road, and that was um, photogenic. That got on primetime TV. And Chrysler ended up having to recall um, over a million vehicles for a software fix, which had to be done at the dealer by reflashing some chips. And um, all of a sudden, this is costing industry serious money, like 10 figures of money. And so people have sat up and started to take notice. So that's the sort of thing that can happen when cars get hacked. Um, here's another example. Anybody recognize this chap? Um, he used to be the CEO of Volkswagen. And when it was figured out that uh, Volkswagen had hacked the Bosch software for the um, lean burn diesel um, engine control units, this is what happened to Mr. Volkswagen's stock price. And so Mr. Volkswagen's board decided that they needed a new CEO. There are billions of dollars of fines have come from that. So you can have insider attacks as well as attacks by external hackers. And there's all sorts of other threats as well. This is a, a big and fascinating and complex thing. So once a car flaw is no longer something that might just occasionally kill one person here or one person there, but something that can be remotely exploited, such that if somebody finds something wrong with a car, they could, in theory, go into all those millions and millions of instances of the car over one or more radio networks and could cause you know, all the Volkswagens in the world at once to accelerate sharply and then turn to the left to crash into the nearest building or pedestrian or whatever, then this is suddenly the sort of thing that you have to worry about seriously and think about patching software. Now, at the same time, you've got car makers moving to autonomy, um, either by a whole lot of little steps, by adding adaptive cruise control and automatic emergency braking and automatic lane keeping and so on one at a time, or else all in a one hour, which is the approach taken by Google and Tesla, let's just build a car with an autopilot. Let's just do it and sell it and you know, leapfrog all the inc incremental stuff. And all of a sudden, you find that Tesla's doing regular software upgrades. In fact, their autopilot was just a software upgrade you could get. Give us $5,000 in your credit card and your car will now drive, it, drive itself. What's not to like? Great, isn't it? So all the others are racing to follow. And um, everybody is going to be um, patching their car remotely by about 2019 or 2020. Now, there's a number of problems. One of them is that testing car software is more difficult than just testing the new release of software for the website you maintain. There you can spin up a virtual machine, you can bring up your environment, you can batter it with your automatic uh, regression test suite, uh, you can figure out what stuff you've broken by means of your software patch. You can fix that. You can ship the upgrade and done. With a car, 
you end up having something called a lab car, which is a huge big rack of equipment, which has got one instance of every CPU in the car. And um, has got simulators so that you can, for example, press the button to do a 50 kilometer per hour half offset uh, crash against a pillar and you know, see what sort of stuff comes out of the um, electronics. So testing is difficult. And testing is also long term because cars last for 20 or 30 years. So here's the problem. How is a car that you buy new today going to be patched in 2037? Does this mean that, they, that all the test rigs for every car that's ever been made between now and then have to be kept by Mercedes and Volkswagen and so on in huge data centers? Do they have to maintain programmers who know how to do all that patching? Do they have to maintain the whole tool chain? What's involved in patching 20-year-old software anyway? Suppose I was to go and dig out the cupboard, the Sun 3 slash 80 workstation that I use for my PhD, and try to get it into shape to connect it to the internet nowadays. You any idea how much work would be involved? You know, 25 years worth of uh, patches having to be backported, of software having to be written to deal with threats that nobody dreamed of back then. So you have to actually the car every five years. Well, if you change the car every five years, then what's going to happen is that Mercedes CO2 emissions will go up by a factor of four. And that's not acceptable in policy grounds. You know, the, 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 the German militants would want to close down the entire car industry. Okay, so that's cars. Now here's medical devices. How many CPUs can you see? So this is the intensive care unit at the hospital in Swansea, where my friend Harold Thimbleby is a computer science professor. And his thing is um, safety usability. And it turns out that infusion pumps, that's the things that pump the morphine into your arm if you had a car crash, kill about as many people as cars do. And, you know, 30 or 40,000 in America, two or 3,000 in Britain. That's the order of magnitude. And how they kill is they've all got different controls. And you may have half a dozen different ones in each um, intensive care unit. Here, for example, you see all sorts of different layouts for numerical entry. They're all different. Here you've got two pumps called Bodyguard 545. On this one, you see increase the dose, press 5, and decrease, press 0. And there, it's 2 and 0. So how come you have got two devices with the same model number that have different controls? In aviation, they do it differently. The 757 and the 767 have exactly the same cockpit, so a pilot with a rating on one can step into another and fly it. But in medicine, they do the things the other way around, which kills people. It's a little bit like cars in the 1920s, where if you got into a Humber, you'd have the accelerator there and the brake there and the clutch there. But if you got into a Lanchester, the accelerator's in the middle between the brake and the clutch. And if you got into a Model T Ford, the accelerator's in the dashboard and the gear change is one of the pedals. Right? So whenever you get into a different car, you've got to spend 10 minutes in the rental lot figuring out how to drive it and hopefully not crash into too many people before you can drive it away. And that's where we are stuck with medical devices. Standards? Yeah, there's plenty of standards. There's a standard, for example, which says that liters should always be a capital L so that you don't mistake it for a one. Good boy, go to the top of the class. But what's this here? <laughs> so this is fundamentally a, a case of broken regulation. The FDA only employs a couple of engineers and they're, they're not allowed to actually touch the equipment that they um, certify. They can only look at about, you know, several shelf feet of documentation that's provided. And apparently, whenever any of them raises a query about some of the documentation, uh, the vendor's uh, congressman phones up the FDA president and starts talking about his budget. So it's a completely broken system. The EU is trying to fix that by looking at um, upgrading its own uh, medical devices regulation. 
But this is an example of the sort of problem you get in another um, safety critical area. And this is now becoming suffused with software. Now, up until now, the FDA has been unwilling to pull any of the infusion pumps that regularly kill people. But a couple of years ago, when somebody showed that one could be hacked over Wi-Fi, they panicked. Right? People might be um, happy to be killed by things which are genuine accidents, but they're very much less happy to be killed by things that might be hostile action. Right? We've got stuff in our brains from the evolutionary past which make us very leery of intent, and in particular of hostile intent, of saber-toothed tigers or whatever in the cave. And um, so this is all going to have to get fixed. We need to get in post-approval studies and adverse event reporting. In other words, we need to get a learning system, which in regulatory terms is what we also need with cars. We need security breach reporting. We need safety event reporting. We need all sorts of things that can feed into the regulators so the regulators can say, right, guys, the next raft of safety patches that you do next year have got to fix the following um, top five issues. So there are some interesting emergent themes among these different industries. Um, and uh, as, as, as I mentioned, the, uh, when the Hospira Symbic infusion pump got hacked, the FDA panicked and, uh, and, and ordered a recall. Another issue you get is that software upgrades can break certification. Um, I don't know if many people here um, remember the first DDoS attack on panics back in 1997. Um, that was, in fact, done by some bad people who took over a number of Unix uh, boxes in Portland, Oregon, which were, in fact, in or attached to medical devices. And as a condition of FDA certification, uh, the, the, the uh, Unix uh, had to be a, 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 of a certain update status, which by then was well known to be hackable. So the bad guys knew that if you could find um, Unix medical devices, um, then they were basically meat in the market. So, from this, you learn that you need to integrate the security and safety life cycles properly, which is something that basically nobody does, and also that safety usability is a big soft spot, which is also the case with cars. The third vertical that we looked at um, was electricity. And here it's interesting because in electricity substations, you've typically got a 40-year life cycle for a substation, and the protocols which people use don't support authentication. Now, this may have been okay in the days when all um, lines were dedicated. You had point-to-point -point microwave links. You had leased lines from the phone company. But about 15 years ago, people started using IP networking because it's cheaper. And then some people uh, in British Columbia, in fact, noticed that this was creating a huge big hole because if you knew the IP address of a sensor, you could read it, and if you knew the IP address of an actuator, you could activate it. And so they did a startup out of UBC, which became the company Belden, which basically provides specialist firewalls so that you can have your control system network on this side running DNP3, and you can have your evil internet over here with TCP IP and UDP and all the other things that we know and love and hate. Uh, and uh, the world still works. You can still use 20, 30-year-old electronic equipment, and the bad guys with luck can't get through. But to do that, you have to have control points, and you have to understand um, the protocols that you're trying to defend. So reperimetrization is one of the things that we learn from looking at the um, electricity supply industry. And there is perhaps a way forward for cars. Because if you could have one component that con connects the car to the outside world and just replace it every five years with a completely new one, a new mobile phone or whatever, maybe that's a way forward. But if any of you have read um, the recent Checkaway paper on car security, uh, they point out that a car nowadays may have 10 different RF um, attack points. You can go in through the tire pressure sensors or pairing, Bluetooth pairing provided for mobile phones or um, all sorts of other things, and there tends to be vulnerabilities in device drivers or glue code that let you in. Anyway, these give us some interesting data points. So what's the big challenge? Well, it's that in the established non-IT industries, you've got this static approach, pre-market testing, standards that change slowly, if at all, and a time constant of typically a decade. Right? You simply can't change control system protocols that fast. 
because you've got big vendors selling into big mature markets and all the stuff has got to interact. But where you've got malicious adversaries who can scale bugs into attacks and run these um, you know, potentially on a global scale, then you need a dynamic approach to patching, as with phones and laptops. And they're the time constants a month. So there's a two order of magnitude speed up. And what happens to a large and somnolent and proliferating bureaucracy when it suddenly has to work at 100 times the speed? That's the problem facing the EU and regulatory agencies in America and Canada and everywhere else. So um, you can go and read our paper online as to the policy uh, recommendations we come up with. Here are the sort of things that policymakers have got to think about. Who's going to investigate incidents and to whom will they be reported? And how's all this going to be automated? Right In Europe alone, you've got 25,000 fatal road traffic accidents every year. You've got 10 times the number of accidents resulting in serious injury. Um, total in insurance claimable accidents is up in the millions. If you're going to need telemetry to arbitrate a whole lot of these claims, then how is it going to be collected? You can't do that as at present by simply putting a subpoena on Mr. Tesla and getting a dump of data and then hiring a CS prof to stare at it for a month. That doesn't work. That has got to be replaced by something that's properly engineered and scalable. How do we embed responsible disclosure? Again, countries' national laws and state-level laws vary quite a lot on this. On Europe, we've got an NIS directive which presumes uh, that stuff gets reported to your local privacy regulator and or your three or four lesser agencies. What's going to bring them to pass on the relevant attack and vulnerability data to car safety regulators? GCHQ isn't going to do it. Anything that comes in there, they'll stamp TSSCI. And they'll say, car regulator, sorry, there's nobody there with a clearance, can't help, go away. So how do you re-engineer the system so that that can work? How do we bring safety engineers and security engineers together? This is something that's perhaps a little bit more tractable for academics, because after all, we teach both subjects. And perhaps we can start doing something for the next generation. And at Cambridge, I've started teaching um, software engineering and security engineering together in the same first year course. So what I do is instead of having them separately, as if you know in my book, security engineering is part one and software engineering is part three. So I've kind of done a merge sort of those so that we look at what can go wrong, whether by random happenstance or as a result of malice, uh, and how this happens at various levels from usability through protocols and access controls and so on. And then I look at what you can do about that systematically in terms of security policies, safety cases, and how these can interact in particular case studies. And then about how you can have emerging system stuff, redundancy, scaling, and so on and so forth. And that, I think, should be the future of how you go about teaching such things to undergraduates. But persuading everybody in the world to do that and scaling it out to many universities is a labor of 10 or 20 years. What do you do in the short term? Well, last year, uh, last month, in fact, I went and spoke at Bosch's big engineering conference. And it turns out that they've already brought their safety engineers and uh, security engineers together into one professional practice within the company because they can see from urgent business um, pressures uh, that this is going to be needed. Next thing, will regulators all need security engineers? The 20 odd agencies in Europe who think about car safety or inspect some form has been stamped in the process to taking a car to market. Are they all going to need you know, someone from this room working for them or consulting for them? Well, the problem is that at present, many of these agencies don't even employ an engineer, let alone a security engineer. And if they don't have anybody who's even done MechEng 101 and they're um, you know, doing stuff for the car industry, but instead they're lawyers and economists and so on, then there's clearly an even bigger deficit than the one that they're worrying about here. Probably uh, you have to e eventually re-engineer the whole thing. But it's very difficult, particularly in a distributed system like Europe, to say, right, we're going to take these 20, 20 agencies and merge them into one. There will be screams, because each of these agencies was the result of a very long-winded political process whereby wheels and deals were done and port was allocated and some member state gleefully captured this agency to go in its capital city. 
You can't just turn around to a member state and say, sorry, we're taking away one of your sources of jobs and patronage. In practice, what we probably need to do is create another agency so that there's some more patronage to hand out. So we need a European security engineering agency, which the politicians can then happily fight over. That's probably the only way forward. Anyway. And then there's things like, how do you prevent abuse of lock-in? Because business being business, people will try and use all the stuff that we've been talking about earlier to create lock-in to build their monopolies. Um, down south, for example, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act now has got an exemption that allows you to repair tractors without going to jail for uh, breaching a, a, a copyright enforcement mechanism. Why? Because John Deere put code in their tractors which said that if you don't bring your tractor to an authorized John Deere repairer uh, every year and pay us $200 minimum fee to come in the door, regardless of whether or not there's anything wrong with it, then we will magically stop your, tra your tractor working. And people said, hey, no, we, you know, we're not going to put up with this. We're going to get our oscilloscopes out and our debuggers and we're going to make our tractors work regardless. And the uh, political reaction was sufficiently severe that they carved out an exemption from the otherwise sacred IP laws. This is the sort of tussle that you can expect in spades over the next 10 or 20 years. This is just the beginning. So policy recommendations that we come up with included requiring vendors to self-certify for the CE mark that products can be patched if need be. Now, I don't know if you've ever bought an object in Europe, but if you go and buy an electronic thing or, in fact, even a, a stuffed toy, it will have on the label a little CE symbol, and that is a manufacturer self-certification that it abides by all relevant safety standards. So rather than spelling out which standards, the, the vendor just has to say that they comply with whichever are relevant, and this means that you can't use lead paint on toys, and if you pull a teddy bear's eyes out, it mustn't leave a sharpened spike that could uh, put your kid's eye out, and so on and so forth. Now, we already, as it turns out, have a couple of eyes of standards for vulnerability life cycle management. And so what this interestingly means is that when Mr. Xiao Mai goes and sells CCTV cameras that have got a factory hard-coded root password and cannot have their software upgraded, so they are, they've got a, a built-in vulnerability for life, then these cameras don't comply with those international standards. And so the customs man at the port in Rotterdam should just simply have said, sorry, this container goes back to Shanghai. You could do that with existing rules. But of course, the customs men don't realize it, the bureaucrats don't realize it. And again, there's going to be a big tussle as people produce crap products and governments figure out what they're going to do with it. And in many cases, they may be able to use existing resources against the, these bad actors. Creating a European security engineering agency to support policymakers. This is one of the things that we argue because there should be some people in Brussels um, who understand this stuff, to whom other policymakers in Brussels can turn when they're trying to figure out what should be the software update um, regulations for you know, your latest Kayla doll or whatever people are getting upset about. Product liability directors should be extended to services so that People can't arbitrage around that and see to it that we report breaches and vulnerabilities to safety regulators and users, not just to the, the spooks and the uh, secret police people. Now, <clears throat> if you're a policy person, you can go and chase all that up in our uh, document. But for this audience, let me think about how this translates to engineering. Now, there's a tradition in computer science um, of looking for grand challenges. What um, big challenges are there around which we can organize a number of different research threads? And um, the point that I'm making today is that figuring out how we do security and indeed dependability in a sustainable way once you start getting software in everything, including durable goods, is just such a challenge. You can think of it as sustainable software or sustainable security. But, you know, computer science has been for many years about managing complexity, right? And we've done this in a whole series of stages. Fortran came along so you didn't have the complexity of writing everything in assembler and remembering which register held which variable. Then you've got structured languages so that you can get a lot of your bugs at compile time. Then you've got objects 
which give you a further improvement, which make code more readable. Then you get automatic regression test suites so that you don't reintroduce old bugs that you thought that you dealt with already. We have been developing tools for the last 50 years that help us to roll the ball further up the complexity mountain. And this is the next challenge now. How do you deal with 20-year patching? Well, we need a more stable and powerful tool chain. If I'm writing navigation code now in Cambridge that will go in a Land Rover in 2020, I would like to choose my tools, my compiler, my editor, um, and all the other stuff that I rely on, the linker, Git, Garrett, Jenkins, the whole lot. I would like to know that that will actually be around and usable in 20 years' time so I can do the maintenance. How far away from that? Well, hey. This can be extremely complex, and there's a number of examples from crypto, things like API, security, and so on. Tell us that stuff breaks as it becomes more complex, as you get more and more transactions that you can do in your hardware security module. Eventually, two of them will interact, and the thing is suddenly insecure. Uh, crypto software, I'll talk a little bit more about that in five or ten minutes. Carl's teachers, how do you sustain all the test environments? If testing the software for a 2017 model Land Rover requires this great big stack of equipment here, and for a 2018 model requires this other big stack of equipment over here, and so it goes on, then pretty soon um, your car company needs a data center the size of the Dells just to hold all the test equipment. At present, the car makers don't like that. They like to cannibalize and repurpose their, their lab cars, uh, gosh, every uh, few years. Because otherwise, there's too many of them and it's too much bother. And there's only one company produces good ones. And it would be difficult for another company to get in to, to compete because they'd need to learn you know, all the details of all the chips that the various component makers produce. So how do you fix that problem? How do you sustain a great diversity of test environments? Control systems teach, can small changes to the architecture limit what you have to patch? Is it possible to put all the network defenses into one um, network workstation which sits between uh, your workstation, between your substation bus and the evil internet? Could you do something similar for cars? Could you shrink the RF attack interface to the point that you can modularize things and just have a plug and play module? Could you perhaps bring it in uh, bring it together with the fact that computer vision is getting better all the time and people might actually want to do an upgrade for their computer vision model module which has got more CPU and more RAM and so on. Could you get people used to the idea of a regular hardware update path for their car just as you get regular hardware update paths for example for warplanes. Um, the Android saga teaches us how do you motivate OEMs to patch products they no longer sell. Do you actually need a law which says, part, if you sell cars in Europe, you must supply software updates for 20 years? How do you get such a law through the European Parliament if Daimler and Volkswagen and Peugeot and so on are throwing infinite amounts of money at lobbyists and are taking every MEP out for the most luxurious meals that you can possibly imagine? Is it doable at all? Well, um, back in 2010, uh, the European Parliament managed, after a lot of lobbying from consumer organizations, uh, to pass a law freeing up the market in, in car parts. So there is some precedent for that. We may be able to get something out of that. Uh, but this is not something that people at the political level are starting to discuss yet. Implications for research and teaching. Uh, as I mentioned, I started teaching safety and security together in the same course for first year undergraduates, which is a bit of an eye opener and I wish I'd started it 10 years ago because there's so much overlap and there are so many interesting little crossovers that enable you to pull out um, you know, interesting case studies which uh, make different versions of the same point again and again and again. Um, one of the things that we've been playing about with is can we stop the tool chain at least getting in the way? And one of the things that we started doing as a first hack um, at sustainable security was how can we stop the compiler writers being a subversive fifth column? So the problem I'm thinking about is this. You go and write some crypto code. 
and you put a lot of effort into seeing to it that the central loops execute in constant time, and you don't have any timing attacks on your implementation, and you test it to death, and you ship it, and you're very proud of yourself, and then along comes some clever CS student somewhere who does his PhD in compiler optimization, and he uploads his code into LLVM, and all of a sudden this code says, aha, I can get rid of those instructions there and there and there and there and there. They don't affect the output. No, we didn't want that optimization. And all of a sudden, you've got to go and scratch your head and try and figure out some even more clever way of fooling this new optimizer into not noticing that you've put in some unnecessary instructions. So one of the things that we've known about in the security protocols world for years uh, is that robustness is about explicitness. So is it possible to make explicit programmer intent? Can you have a compiler directive or annotation um, which says um, that, um, I think, I've, I think I've got slides out of order here, so let me just shoot forward. Um, so Laurent Simon is one of my postdocs, is the guy who's been working on this, so David Chisnell is um, our local compiler expert. And we thought, well, tackle the two easy cases first. How do you zeroize sensitive variables? before a function returns. And that in itself turns out to be a very much more difficult problem than you thought when you actually look at LLVM and work through the details. And um, having done that, we then figured out how you would do constant time loops. And the answer is that you can do this stuff, but doing it right is non-trivial. And if anybody's interested in playing with Laurent's code, um, um, you can email him and he'll be happy to share that with you. It's not quite at the point where we'll put it into a public repository. But it, it's a useful example um, of what one can perhaps do in order to try and make the tool chain a little bit more sustainable. Now, this is just one of hundreds of things that are going to have to be done. But at least it's a start. Go find some low-hanging fruit, pick it, then go and find another one and pick it. And gradually, with luck, you can build a bit of momentum and get some feel for the shape of the task ahead. Then there's the economics of this. Who's going to pay for it all? There's all this talk about new business models and vendors saying, well, we'll be like Uber. You know, you'll get your 300,000 kilometers out of our car, but it'll be working 24 hours a day, so it'll all be done in the first five years, and then we recycle it, problem solved. Well, I'm not sure I buy that for all sorts of reasons. But who are the men? direct beneficiaries of maintenance? Well, they're the garages and component suppliers. So I went along to our local garage and I said, um, Glenn, I've heard that maintenance costs are going up with all these fancy cameras and LIDARs that people are stuffing in the bumpers nowadays. Don't they get scrunched in little accidents? Oh yes, Ross, he says, tell me about it. See that Volvo there? He says, lady brought it in, dinged her wing mirror, didn't she? You know how much that cost to fix? 900 pounds. I said, what? Yeah, 900 pounds, he said, because it's got a fancy little camera in it and a fancy little computer to do the automatic lane keeping, doesn't it? So I've got to replace that, and then I've got to take the car to the main dealer in Bedford so that they can realign it on their fancy mats. That's car repair nowadays, he said, Ross, it's expensive. So fine. Who's going to pay for the long tail wing mirror, the, 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 the long tail maintenance? Well, the people who sell the wing mirrors. Right? And, and similarly, if you talk to some of the uh, parts vendors, they put effort into supply chain in Africa. Bosch, for example, has got Bosch-approved car dealers, and they let you use their, their logo in your little garage out in the bush in Kenya, uh, and they'll send you in a training course, and they'll give you their diagnostic equipment, and the quid pro quo is that you put in their spare parts rather than cheap Chinese ones. That's already an established business model. So we can look at other ways of running business models other than the Uber business model. So the grand challenge for research is how much is going to have to change over the next 20 years. Computer science, as I said, is about managing complexity. We've done all this stuff over the past 50 years to enable us to roll the stone a bit further up the complexity mountain. And what else is going to be needed for sustainable computing once we've got software in just about everything and once the things that contain software are not just things that you throw away in a year or two, like your phone or your laptop, but things that you hope to run for 20 or 30 years, like your car, your tractor, um, or your cardiac pacemaker. <laughs>
Um, another example of what you can do, I mentioned the difficulty of doing testing in a lab car and the cost of these things. Well, I know some people here um, are interested in doing research in SGX, so I just knocked this slide together. And um, the fundamental problem with testing is that you have got software from lots of mutually mistrustful people. Bosch doesn't want Mercedes to see their software, they certainly don't want ZF or Conti or Magna or whatever, and everybody hits and mistrusts everybody else, and they've got terrible problems when they're building software that's got components from mutually mistrustful suppliers, all sorts of NDAs and other stuff like that. If, you, if what you need to not have a large data center full of old test cars right, is some way of virtualizing this, then maybe this is a new use for SGX or TrustZone or Cherry or any of the other tools that we have for hardware-assisted operating system security. Because then you could perhaps hope in future to spin up a VM which has got a car simulator in it with various little enclaves and this has got Bosch's software and this has got ZF's and this has got Magna's and you've got sufficient guarantees to keep everybody happy that the Bosch software can't go and spy on the ZF software and vice versa and yet you as the OEM or the contract systems integrator can see well enough what's going into and coming out of all these units that you can do a reasonable debugging job. Perhaps that's a wholly new use for things like SGX. And we're going to need not just one or two innovations like this, we're going to need dozens and dozens and dozens. What about a provably secure API for your turn indicator? Lots of people do work on formal methods. Surely there are some parts of the car are simple enough that you might want to somehow be able to reassure yourself that you will never have to upgrade this software. And if all the turn indicator does is flash once or flash three times or flash until told to stop flashing, uh, plus a few service things such as change the Mac key for the CAN bus and so on, perhaps you can boil this. <laughs> Therein lie about 10 PhD theses, I can tell you. <laughs> Been there, done that, got the scars, right? But perhaps with a bit of luck, you can boil this down to something that's simple and robust enough that you can say, right, we're reasonably confident that we're not going to have to replace this anytime soon, quantum or no quantum, right? So you can just seal it up and forget about it. That could actually be worth quite a lot of money. Upgradable hardware components. Upgradable software. Um, people like Satya down at CMU have been doing work on microclouds. Do you have to have a microcloud in every car? Do you have um, a box full of lots of CPUs that can then go and run virtual cloud software from all the various vendors? There, again, is another possible way forward. Upgrade paths for infrastructure. If you have to do something like upgrading DNP3 in a substation, is there any way that you could um, think ahead and provision for that in advance so that it could be done on the basis of hardware already shipped? Maybe not now, uh, but maybe in, in 10 or 15 years' time. Stable interfaces, stable interfaces within things and stable interfaces between things. And the reason for thinking about this is that as you get more and more complexity, so architecture is going to have to do more and more lifting. And you have to think hard about architecture so that you can minimize interaction between components and, and also min minimize economic effects like lock-in. And this is going to be really hard. You know, a few years ago, car people thought that you could minimize interaction by having half a dozen different CAN buses in the car connected by bridges. But as stuff moved towards autonomy, this becomes more and more difficult because all the interesting stuff has got to be on the powertrain CAN bus, right? Because that's where the interaction happens that's safety critical. So that CAN bus has to know steering input so that it can uh, thrust vector and traction control and you can't just put that somewhere else because it's then not tightly coupled enough. So thinking about architecture in specific application contexts is something that engineers are going to have to get better at. And this is all what security engineering is going to look like over the next 20 years. Um, we're not going to be bored anytime soon. Thanks. Yeah. A few minutes for questions. Adam Ross can just repeat the question for the camera. Um, I noticed when you were talking about things that were going on in the European Union and EU and all that, you kept saying we, we, we. Now, the thing is, I see that you're in the UK. Yeah. 
a tampon, you will not be able to say we, we anymore soon. You will have to say they. But more seriously, what will the UK do in this situation? So the question is, what will the effects of uh, Brexit and all this be? Um, there will be no effect on UNECE because I anticipate that Britain will remain part of UNECE, which after all includes South Africa, Japan, Russia, Australia, and so on. Um, as far as um, the um, enforcement side is concerned, I think that there will be relatively few changes because if the UK retains a car industry, it will have to continue to abide by the standards promulgated by UNECE and enforced by European institutions, like it or not. So all that's going to happen is that British diplomats will no longer be able to get in the way. Uh, British car makers will still have to do what they're told, and if they want to influence the process, then they'll have to see to it that Joe from Jaguar Land Rover um, is now uh, Joe from uh, Tata Automotive GmbH of Aachen. He'll have a different business card when he goes to meetings in Brussels. But perhaps the effect will be less than you think. Yes? It's open-ended, and this is something that people in the Pentagon... Uh, uh, the, 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 quest, the question is, uh, will we have a finite period of time? Uh, the answer is, it always lasts longer than you think. And go and speak to the Pentagon about their uh, B-52 bomber, for example, you know, which is still in service, what, 60 years after it was introduced, uh, twice the design lifetime. Uh, and um, you end up with stuff just having to be uh, repaired, even though that wasn't anticipated. Uh, and that's, that's how much of the third world works. You know, they get second-hand stuff, and they just keep on fixing it so long as it will still run. So, yes. <laughs> Carry on. Oh, sorry. So I wonder how, um, how did airplanes um, handle the security when it's all so full of computers? Um, well, aircraft are somewhat different um, because the... Uh, um, Aircraft are not in general connected to the internet. There are one or two uh, cockpit systems that increasingly may be through various uh, air data things. But what tends to happen is that particular boxes will get taken out and replaced uh, with better boxes at various midlife upgrades or at um, uh, you know, large uh, maintenance events. It's not obvious, and it may well be the case that over time, aircraft may acquire some of these problems uh, to a greater extent as well. Yes? You mentioned that, that uh, banks and credit card companies <coughs> can often just dump fraud risks on their card, card blue, so I was wondering some specific ways they do that. The typical uh, way in the UK um, is that if you complain about fraud, they just look at their terms and conditions and they say you must have been gro grossly negligent because your card was used and uh, your uh, credentials were presented. And um, this may in fact be um, a matter of technical fraud, but it often takes considerable resources to prove that. Uh, this is something about which I've written at great length in, in other contexts. Uh, lots of people come to us with complaints about fraud and sometimes we discover a new modus operandi that the banks have simply ignored. And the problem there um, is, again, that the regulator is captured. Um, the, the, the relevant regulator, the FCA in Britain, uh, tends to rely on people who were working for banks a year or two ago and will be working for banks again in two or three years' time. And so it's all very cosily in bed with the industry that is trying to regulate. Yes? Uh, it's very, uh, my question relates to a more policy, uh, uh, policy problem. I mean, the in, the, a lot of the institutions that you say, the hospitals, car makers uh, they're, they're, and uh, utilities, uh, electric utilities, they're not IT-centric organizations Exactly. At all. 
Um, how do you affect, as, as if, from a regulatory standpoint, how do you affect the culture change so they, they even start looking at these, these matters? Because uh, I work for S-Script, the company up the road, it's a Bosch company. Um, when you deal when you deal with these uh, these industries, it's not even on the radar screen usually. Well, I'm afraid that what usually changes policy is when you've got a bleeding baby on the front page of the newspapers, and even when that happens, um, you may not get a change because, for example, um, a month or two ago, um, half a dozen hospitals in the UK had their systems brought down by the WannaCry worm, and. What happened there was a textbook case in uh, blame avoidance. You know, although that was a worm that was put together with an NSA GCHQ um, uh, weapon that had been leaked, GCHQ said, um, don't blame us for cyber weapons, everybody develops them, but this shows that you need an agency like us to defend against evil criminal hackers. And the NHS said, don't blame us, this is Microsoft's fault for not giving us free patches for Windows XP. We looked at our logs and observed that all the affected machines uh, appeared to be Windows Vista rather than Windows XP. Um, so, I mean, clearly something was wrong there. And every single other institutional player gave the, res the, the blame avoidance response that you would expect. Microsoft said it was all the NSA's fault for developing cyber weapons, and so it went round. Now, my own view in the matter was um, that the um, five or six hospitals um, in question were affected because they were poorly managed, whereas the other 230 odd hospitals in Britain weren't because they had either closed port 445 on their firewalls or they'd bothered to patch their Vista machines or had none of the uh, vulnerable Vista machines doing anything that mattered. Right? So, so, so the, the right remedy, in my view, would have been to sack the CIOs, the CEOs, the CISOs of the five affected hospitals. But of course, the institution of the NHS was entirely unprepared to do that because that's not how it responds. It always says it wasn't the fault of any individual. It was a system failure. Give us more money. And that's exactly why you've got all these people dying from infusion pump failures, right? Because nobody at a senior level will ever take responsibility for, for, for having put five different types of infusion pump in the um, intensive care department and not stop to think about the implications for training and certification and so on of staff. So ultimately, this is down to how people behave in organizations, how organizations are set up, and how they often interact very badly with technology. So if the ransomware wasn't enough, then what will be a <laughs> rate shutdown, I guess? I'm afraid, to be quite brutal about it, that if you want safe systems, then when they fail, you have to kill rich and powerful people. That's, what, that's, that's why um, air safety is reasonably good, because when a plane crashes, the pilot and co-pilot get to the scene of the accident first. And since pilots tend to be rich and powerful people within their organizations, and CEOs are often ex-pilots, they don't want to die, so they take care. Right? With medical devices, it's very different. People who die as a result of an infusion pump accident are typically very young, very old, or very car crashed, and in any case, very sick. And if anybody notices that that was untoward, they'll just blame the nurse. The medical director of the hospital never gets hit as a result, and so nobody cares. Okay, on that note, we're out of time. <laughs>